Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar on our latest book, Forecasting Tomorrow, the Future of Safety Excellence. I'm Tracy Long, the Director of Operations at ProEx Safety. Is your safety strategy ready for what's coming? Safety strategies of the future must align with evolving business goals. Emerging trends are becoming increasingly visible regarding how safety is viewed and strategically managed and how progress is measured. The seven predictions found within the book, which will be outlined during this webinar, are based on the author's years of deep experience as trusted safety advisors across all industries. So let's turn it over to them. Terry, Sean. Thank you very much, Tracy. Happy to be here with everyone today and talk about our, our latest book. The reason we started putting this together from my perspective is we've worked with some wonderful organizations throughout the world and working with most of the top tier in safety, we discovered some trends, we discovered some ways of thinking. Uh, Terry and I believe that all progress begins with thinking differently, so we wanted to share some of the great concepts, the ways organizations are managing and, and getting people involved and focusing on value rather than activities. We wanted to share these ideas. There's a lot of books written about where we're at today in safety and where we've come from. We wanted this book to focus on where we believe the future will be, or at least over the next 10 years, based on things that we're seeing some of the great organizations doing. Terry, what were your thoughts? Well, you know, very similar to yours, Sean, but one of the things that impressed me was that some of the leaders that we talk to uh, on a regular basis in our, in our consulting practice see particular things happening in the future of safety and others don't. But what, what really impressed me was that almost nobody saw all of it. You know, the, the way I kind of put this whole big picture together in my mind and, and in, in consulting with you also on this was a, a collection from everybody. And, you know, when I saw that some people see it and some people don't, I thought, why can't we put it together so everybody sees where the future's going and nobody gets ambushed out there in, in their efforts to further uh, their safety excellence? That's great. And, and your point on safety excellence, that's where we want to start today. In the book, we outlined seven key predictions. And we wanted to share these prediction, predictions with you during this webinar. Now, of course, in the book, we go into greater detail. Terry and I have a lot of articles on these different topics, and, and we consult around many of them as well. But one of the first things we wanted to, we wanted to start with was how people are framing excellence. I know when I first started working with Terry in 2005, one of the things that I heard him say that rung so so true with me is that if people define safety as the absence of accidents, a very dangerous perception gets created. And it sounds like we didn't have any injuries. I was doing these things. If safety means not getting hurt, then anything that I do that doesn't get me hurt must be safe. You know, and even still today, three weeks ago, I was in a major home improvement chain, and I found myself in the back there. My daughters went off to use the restroom, and I was standing there waiting on them, and I saw a huge sign that they have for kind of promoting safety, and their slogan was, safety is when nothing happens. What flawed logic. You know, I understand what they're trying to do with this, but how we frame things is so critical we lose our sense of vulnerability if we think we just haven't had any injuries or incidents. We must be doing the right things. Companies are evolving their thinking around this, not just in safety, but in all facets of operational excellence. I'm seeing more and more companies discontinuing using the term best practice, and they're starting to use the term better practice. I, again, I know it's just terminology, but what they believe is if we stop if we adopt or implement a best practice, might we stop looking for a better way? There's always going to be a better way. A CentOS, a client of ours, a great organization, they have a corporate value that permeates throughout all their decisions. They call it positive discontent. And what they mean by that is we celebrate our successes and we know we can always be better. Yeah, the, this idea of a vacuum uh, being the, the ideal of safety has got to go away. You know, the, the, uh, by the way, uh, these seven predictions that we're making aren't the only predictions that Sean and I have made in safety. There are a lot of other things that we see, a lot of other trends that might impact one industry or another, one client or another, but these are the seven that we think are big, mega, they're going to impact almost everybody. And what a lot of these organizations are facing now is no longer this challenge of getting to zero injuries, which is where we initially thought kind of that's excellence. We got to zero injuries. That, that was a thinking 10, 15 years ago. Now organizations are facing the challenge that they've gotten to zero injuries. They're just not confident that they know precisely how they got 
to zero injuries. So there's now a focus on, you know, are we doing the right things? You know, yes, we want the results. We want to, we're going to be held accountable for the results, but we have to focus on the performance. And then we have to develop our focus or multiple things that we focus on around there. Think of the Olympics. When the Olympics happens hours ahead of us because of the time delay in, in different countries, we'll hear who meddled in an event before we actually see that performance. Hours later, when we see the performance, we'll say to ourselves, that's why that athlete got the gold, and that's why they got the silver. We could see the performance that contributed to the results. So excellence is moving from just a focus on results to knowing precisely how the results were obtained with still that mindset of positive discontent. Terry, what are your thoughts on our prediction number two from Programs of Strategy? Well, we still see a lot of our clients thinking programmatically about safety. Uh, by the way, one of, one of the, and we've written articles about this, we've done blogs about this, uh, the idea that more isn't necessarily better, only better is better. And what we see so many people doing these days, uh, not, not the leaders, not the, the leading thinkers in safety, but some of the others, is they say, our results aren't what they ought to be, we must need to do more. And we've, we've advised so many clients recently, no, you don't need to do more. You're putting plenty of resources, plenty of time, plenty of effort into safety. It's not a matter of quantity, it's a matter of quality. And this is that programmatic thinking. Uh, the, the, the thinking that we need to do more, well, what else do we need to do? And we still have clients come to us and say, what have you got to sell us? You know, I always think of Gallagher and his sledge you know, you know, what's your product and what does it do? It slices, it dices. Safety is not a product, and it's not a combination of products. It's a strategy. And if you're not thinking strategically about safety, you're missing the basic ingredients of what it takes to make it happen. So what does it take? You know, first of all, you have to define success. And that's what Sean was just talking about. It can't be zero accidents. It can't be nothing happens. It can't be the absence. It's not a vacuum. It's not when you suck all the risks out. What's left is, a, you know, is safety. Just two weeks ago, Terry, I was... I was staying at a hotel next to a job site, and on the job site, they had a big sign that says, our aim is zero injuries. And I always shake my head when I see that, because how do you aim at nothingness? <laughs> you have to aim at at least what makes nothingness occur, but that, that involves a strategy. It's not just hopelessly wishing we're not going to have any bad things occur. You know, back in the 60s, there was a sign that was very popular in a lot of businesses that I went to that said, it's better to aim at the moon and miss than to aim at nothing and hit it. You know, and, and yet, what are we aiming at in safety? We're aiming at nothing. <laughs> you know, so uh, again, who leads and who manages safety? This is a really, really important part. Safety is a core value, uh, is, or espouses a core value in most leading companies, and yet it's delegated. What other core values get delegated completely out, you know, and, and, and doing it? And then again, this is that programmatic thinking. Well, go get us a program that will get us where we want to go in safety. And the leaders abdicate their responsibility of truly leading it. Well, also, when you look at what strategy is, a lot of the strategy still in safety, Terry and I call the perpetual cycle of avoiding failure, and it has four components, and it starts with this. We look at our incident rate, next step. We develop an incident rate goal or objective, next step. We develop a list of initiatives, next step. We execute on those initiatives, and then we're back to looking at our incident rate. How did we do? Now, we're all smart people. We all know to avoid the traps of correlation must mean causation, but we fall precisely in it when we do things and have better results. We say to ourselves, we did these things. We had better results. Therefore, we must have had better results because we were doing those things. Not necessarily. Strategy is a framework of choices the organization makes to determine how to capture and deliver value. It's how do we win, not how do we fail less. So we have to make trade-offs. There are things that we're just not going to be able to do in 2016. We're going to have to table until the following year or, or whatever it might be. But we have to look at this and say, are we thinking strategically about this? Not just as Terry says, looking to try to do more. You know, it's amazing to me that the, the leading companies define exactly what kind of style they want their managers to have. Other companies let them bring their style with them from wherever they hired them from. You know, and, and anything's okay. But style of management is a, is a very strategic thing, and, and especially in safety. Yeah, so when we, Terry, you were just talking about the, the leaders actually leading safety. This is a key thing. You mentioned that, and I love that saying, that if safety is a core value, why is it delegated in the organization? Now, what we're starting to see is, is the, the better performing organizations, they're starting to precisely define what the role is they need their leaders to play. And it's going to be different location by location, 
level by level, department by department. This is why, as Terry said, you don't just go out and focus on a bunch of activities. Precisely, what do we need right now that adds value? And when we look at the role of the supervisor, the manager, the executive, whomever it might be, what are the, the most important roles, responsibilities, and results we need from those individuals? When I work with organizations that really get it, that have a great strategy, they have alignment with leadership against that strategy or on that strategy, you know, I can go around and I can ask supervisors, managers, two questions, and more often than not, I get the right answer. Number one, what's your most important responsibility as a leader to help us prevent injuries or prevent accidents? Number two, what's your most important responsibility to help us enhance our culture around safety? They can tell me the right answer, and it's specific to what they're focusing on or what they're facing. But we have to evolve this to where it's not just delegated to leaders away from the safety professional or delegated to the safety professional. We have to have true accountability. And in a lot of companies, accountability is a dirty word. You know, real accountability is what we refer to as proactive accountability. And that's holding people accountable for the things we need them to do. Real accountability is making sure people are doing the things necessary to get the results before checking to see how did we do. And there needs to be a positive aspect, not just a negative aspect to that. Yeah, and you know, so the, we're not suggesting that the leaders have to do everything in safety. That's not it at all. Most leaders cannot you know, they don't have the, the, the power to, to go out and be everything to everybody. But if they don't do the strategic part of safety, then they run the risk that the safety strategy and the overall company strategy are going to be at odds with each other. They're going to compete with each other. And that's what we see in organizations that uh, are not on the leading edge of, of thinking in safety is that they have a, a company strategy, they have a safety strategy, and the two of them obviously never talked before they got together. I'm thinking of an organization we've been working with right now for the past couple of years, and they are a pipeline construction company. So they're a project-based organization. About 90% of their workforce comes and goes every nine months to a year based on the projects that they have. They don't have time to build a real strong culture. Their strategy is on keeping the most important things the most important thing. But back to your point earlier about success defined, they've defined what job site safety excellence looks like. There is a clear visual that supports that. It, there's detail, and it is borne by data, not just opinions. They know precisely this is what our job sites look like when we're excellent, and they know what to look for. But the leaders are all aligned to that, and there's very specific things those leaders do when they, vis when they visit these job sites to proactively and positively hold people accountable for their expectations. But it all starts with agreeing and defining, well, what's it going to look like when we get there? And it's not just zero injuries. What would we see that's common that tells us why we achieve zero injuries? And what are the individual roles, responsibilities, and results we need from those leaders? We have to have that mapped out. We have to have it defined. Otherwise, kind of like what Lewis Carroll and Alice in Wonderland, Cheshire Cat, if you remember that. If you don't know where you're going, then any path will take you there. You have to define where you're going and then start precisely choosing the leaders that we need to lead safety. What are the most important things that they need and what are the most important things that they need to do to add value to our ability to improve safety? You know, a, a leader of a company, uh, generally, uh, either they talk safety and they, they reinforce that message out there, or they say nothing about safety, which sends a very, very dangerous message, or they open their mouth about safety and obviously don't know what they're talking about. And that damages safety also. And these are the, these are the three levels that we see in the client companies that we have out there. So we coach these CEOs and presidents of companies to, to not only say the right thing often enough, you know, but not to say the wrong thing and not to do damage to safety. This is what we're talking about leading. They don't have to do the day-to-day -day work of it, but they have to send the message and make sure that they set the priority and the, st the strategy. Great point. So think in your organization, what are your specific or most important safety roles, responsibilities, and results? Have you defined that by level? And is there proactive accountability to make sure our leaders are doing the most important things on a regular basis and that it's paying off? So we've talked about the leader. Let's move on to our next prediction about kind of the role of the, of the safety professional and how they're going to evolve over time. 
Terry, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, we've got this uh, this little cute uh, saying, grunt to guardian to guru, but this is the progression that we're seeing in organizations. Uh, a lot of safety professionals are grunts. I mean, they are doing the paperwork. We've got some that are office bound. They can't even get out in the field because they've got so much paperwork to do. Then you've got the other ones that are out in the field trying to be the second supervisor. You know, the supervisor doesn't supervise safety. They just supervise production. So the safety guy's got to come around and supervise safety. That means safety has not become a, a, a line item. It hasn't become a, a, an integral part of what you do in your company. So think about the, the position you put your workers in. You know, who's the boss, the safety guy or the, or the supervisor? You know, and, and we, we tell companies, whoever gives them their marching orders, gives them their marching orders, and anybody else is secondary. So how do, how do you get them there? Well, you, these safety professionals have to get out of the grunt work. They have to get out of the trenches and, uh, and start being more strategic in what they're doing. So the next level up is where they become the guardian. They oversee what's happening in the organization. You know, they don't do it all, just like the leader in the organization ought to be the strategic leader, but not necessarily the tactical leader. Uh, safety professionals can step up like that to where the supervisors really make day-to-day -day safety happen, and they are the resource for them to do that. But ultimately, what a safety professional ought to be is the subject matter expert, the person that you can go to for, uh, for what you need to help you manage safety. Safety becomes a line responsibility, and the safety professional becomes the guru that helps everybody fulfill that responsibility. Just this past Monday, I was fortunate to be the morning keynote speaker at an American Society of Safety Engineers event, and the person that gave the opening remarks is the president-elect of ASSE, and he said something that was fitting and, and very well aligned with the message that, that I gave a little bit later. He said that ASSC is really focusing on the role of the safety professional, and they see that evolving. The ASSC is actually, at this time right now as we're recording this, is interviewing a couple of major business CEOs to add to their board. I think that's a wonderful step because ASSC even sees that the role of a safety professional has to evolve to becoming a business advisor. And that's something Terry and I have been saying for a long time. For years, we try to embed safety thinking into the organization. Well, we need to embed business thinking into safety. You know, there's always going to be a need for the technical aspects of safety, but organizations are only going to be as good as the level of thinking that exists in their company. Plus, that if we as safety professionals do not evolve past only being viewed those technical experts or, or supervisors or managers of safety, safety is going to continue to be viewed as a cost center or worse, a necessary evil in the organization. So what we're also seeing is we're also seeing kind of a new a new kind of safety consulting starting to emerge. Terry and I are both very active in LinkedIn groups and a lot of other social media platforms, and we're seeing more and more of this thinking out there. And we're really glad to see that. So we're seeing a change and an evolution from within the companies that we're consulting with, but we're also seeing other consultants start to evolve. And Terry and I are very honored to coach even other safety professionals that have their own consulting firm. We're advisors to even other safety consulting firms, and we're seeing them move past this, here's a one-size-fits-all program that they try to embed into the organization. Uh, I remember reading something that, that somebody said a long time ago that, you know, if you, can't, if you can't make modifications to the program you're installing, that's like buying a car with the hood welded shut. You're always going to be reliant on that technology or that individual. So we're seeing great safety professionals and consultants also change their thinking that it's not, the projects aren't just based on their expertise. The projects are becoming more based on the needs of the organization. And rather than saying who has the best expertise, what do we need within our overall strategy? And, you know, we, we believe we've really started this thinking around this. We have a very comprehensive 10-question framework that we use with organizations to help them develop their three- to five-year strategy. We've done a, more work on this, really, than anyone. But what's interesting that we find is the number three question in our 10-question framework is, what's the scope? And there's a lot of questions, obviously, that lead up to that. The number eighth question that you get to in this framework is, what initiative, based on the data, are we going to do or not do. And what's interesting, a lot of executives give us feedback that what we see is we typically jump right to three, what's the scope or problem, to number eight, what's the program. And that's not the way that this is going to be successful. So we're very, 
very honored to see other consultants that we advise start to change their thinking around this. You know that, that uh, grunt to guardian to guru applies to the consultants also. We, we, companies have always hired people to do busy work in safety, you know, as, as a contractor, consultant like that. But what they're, what they're seeing more and more is they really need the guru. They need someone who can come in and talk to them about strategic safety excellence, not just how to get the programs going and, and be in compliance. And I think from that, you're, I, we also believe part of this prediction is you're going to start to see even the RFP process and RFI process start to change the request for proposals, that there's going to be a lot less over the next 10 years. Here, tell us what your defined program is and what the value and feature and benefits are to us to rather, well, we need you to come in and first diagnose. I believe it was Socrates that said to prescribe before diagnosing is malpractice. And, you know, I'm glad to see that others are starting to change their thinking around this, that you can't prescribe what the approach is of the program. You have to understand the organization. What works for one site, even within the same system or company, might not work for the other. We all have unique cultures, different histories of successes and failures and leadership styles and followership styles. One size fits all never works, whether you're buying clothes or trying to improve safety. So we've seen that change there. The, the sixth prediction we're making has to do with the overall impression of what safety programs, what they look like, but also what they're beginning to focus on. Yeah, and, and I think this is one of the, the critical things that we're seeing probably the most often out there is that the thinking about what a safety program is changing. Sean mentioned RFPs. You know, an, an RFP is a company self-diagnosing. This is a company saying, I've got a headache, put out an RFP for aspirin. You know, and what we find more often than not is that the companies don't know what they need. They know they have a problem, but they don't know what they need. But one of the problems is we tend to address the, we, we tend to look at the people in the organization as the problem. You know, as companies have, have become more the masters of their technical engineering aspects of safety, they've got, they've got this sticky, uh, uh, people thing that's left out there. And, you know, a lot of the, the CEOs, a lot of the, the leaders of companies were great technical people, but the, the people part of it still evades them. You know, even Henry Ford, uh, Sean always quotes him as saying, every time I get a pair of hands, it's got a brain attached to it. You know, it, it complicates things. Engineers tend to think that way. So how do you handle these people things? Well, one of the things that's changing radically in the leading companies out there is they're quitting thinking about the people as the problem with safety and they're realizing that the people are the customer of the safety program that they can't be dictated to they can't be told to buy into this they can't be told to get engaged they've got to be sold on this I, I had a major CEO uh, not too long ago say oh come on Terry you don't have to sell people on safety no not on the concept of safety you got to sell them on your program for safety and, and, and there's compliance things that you don't sell them on you don't say pretty please lock out tag out but what we're talking about here is discretionary we're not talking about the future of safety compliance we're talking about the future of safety excellence and you do have to market if you want discretionary effort because they're giving it to you at their discretion. It's not something they have to do, but if they would do, would help us create you know, excellence and also meet our vision of what that means. Yeah, I, I asked in a recent article that I wrote, would your people pay to be a part of your safety program? Would they pay to go to your training? Would they pay to go to your meetings? Would they pay to have your, your rule book you know, out there? If they, if they wouldn't, you know, and what was, what was really frightening is when I, I, I gave that in a talk not too long ago, everybody in the room laughed. You know, like, oh, gee, yeah, no, that, this is ridiculous. Nobody would do that. What a pertinent question, though. Are your people bought into your safety program? But, but this also r really has us looking at how these programs are evolving to get a, getting away from what we've been talking about, just searching for a new program, to answering the question, how is it going to contribute value? Uh, imagine a manufacturing manager, and, and I know some of you are listening in on, on, on today's webinar. Imagine if one of your department managers went out and bought a new machine because it looked neat and decided, hey, I want to install that into the, our manufacturing process because it's the neatest and, and it looks pretty neat. 
Well, the questions would be asked, how is this going to contribute to operational efficiency? How is it going to contribute to providing value to the process, to the customers? Yet, that's what we often do in safety. We go out and look for that next new program. If it doesn't immediately create at least the perception of value, we end up disengaging people. You know, and if we disengage the very people we're trying to engage, and if we happen to hit zero injuries, it's born from a have to versus a want to type of philosophy. What we're talking about is creating a want to type of culture. And that means we need to focus on how do we add them value. You know, and part of this is we have to resell ourselves on the Hawthorne effect over and over and over again. We see people say, well, I bought this program. It worked for a while. Now it's kind of going, well, come in and fix it. Well, it worked for a little while because it had a Hawthorne effect. It, nobody ever bought into it. Nobody, it never became cultural. It never became the way you do things around here. It, it just was a flash in the pan, and now it's gone. That thinking is changing. And for that, how organizations are measuring safety is changing. Dean Spitzer, who wrote a great book in 2007 called Transforming Performance Measurement, one of the things that he asked in that question is, or one of the things that he mentioned in that book, which was great thinking, was organizations will never get what they want until they start measuring what they want. In safety, we tend to focus on the things that we don't want, and we all know that, the whole lagging indicator, but organizations, the ones that we're working with at least, are evolving their thinking to even past leading indicators. Leading indicators in a lot of organizations, quite frankly, are measurements of activities, and that falls us back into that correlation causation. We did these things, we measured these observations, these audits, these safety share at every safety meeting, training, warm bodies in the seats, and we had improved performance, therefore, fill in the blank. Organizations are starting to evolve to what we call transformational safety indicators. You know, think of your blood pressure as an example of a transformational safety indicator. Whether you've had a heart attack or not is a lagging indicator. Your leading indicators are how often are you exercising, are you eating right? If you're leading a healthy life, you're eating right, you're exercising, and you check your blood pressure one day, which is a profound transformational indicator, and it tells you, wow, it's high. The answer isn't, to Terry's point, we need to do more exercise. The answer is finding the right intervention. And as companies are starting to evolve this, they're getting past just measuring activities, and they're starting to look at what do we want. Well, the Gallup Q12 survey taught us and a lot of others, you can actually measure feelings, and there's science around that. What do we want people to feel? What do we want people to know? Uh, we have clients that measure what's called the safety IQ. Do people know the most important things they need to know about this program, the, the values, the approach, the strategy? You can measure these things. Do they believe what we need them to believe? And that's part of the strategy and what's it going to look like. You know, one of the things Terry, I've heard him say this many times, is that culture is not necessarily the way we do things around here. Really what culture is is what's common. What's common in an organization? What are the beliefs that are common? What beliefs would be common if we had excellence in our culture? What are the things we need people to do, the skill sets, the competencies, and what would we see them doing, hear them saying that lets us know we're in the right path here? So start evolving to the things that you need to measure and measure what you want, not just what you don't want. If you're doing training, does it change what people know? If you're putting people into training, does it change what they believe and does it change what they do? If it doesn't, there's really no return on investment. And then the ultimate qualifier, if you're doing all of that and it changes what people know, changes what they believe and do, but it doesn't change the business results, still there's no real return on investment. So two final questions we want to leave you with in this particular this particular aspect of the of the predictions we're making here is ask these two questions about your own programs, about your own measurements. Number one, are we as efficient as we could be? Are there opportunities to be more efficient? Because we want efficiency. Number two, are we delivering real, or at least the perception of value with our safety efforts here? If we're not delivering value, if we're disengaging people, or they don't see the value in the activities, again, it's that have to versus the want to type of, of thinking. Make sure we're measuring what we want. And don't just measure activities. Yes, we want a lot of activities. We want engagement. So what would that look like? Let's measure that. If we had engagement, what would be common in our organization that tells us why when we get great results, we got them rather than the feeling of knock on wood, we must be doing the right things, haven't had any injuries here. 
Yeah, you know, companies are getting away from that success is grudging compliance and willing and realizing that it's not, it's willing cooperation. You know, and engagement is one thing, but willing engagement, active engagement, uh, hearts and minds versus hands and feet kind of engagement is what uh, almost everyone is after to get to that real level of excellence. So these are the seven major things that we have seen that almost all organizations are aware of some of them. Almost no organizations are really thinking about all seven of these. We think it's critically important not only that you realize each one of these things individually, but that you look at them collectively and say, how are they going to impact our efforts to be excellent in safety into the near future? I like what Tracy said when she started the webinar for today, is your strategy ready for the future? We hope the predictions that we're making based on data, not just our opinions, and based on what we're seeing becoming more and more visible trends, better practices rather than best practices in the organizations. We hope that this has helped you think about things a little bit differently, and I'd like to turn it back over to Tracy now. Thank you for your participation today. Uh, we would love to hear from you, find out where you are in your journey to safety excellence, and how these predictions will help shape your decisions and strategy moving forward. We wish you great success.